what what is the purpose of creating Plutus as opposed to yellow? What are the advantages of of doing that? So um, Plutus actually was here first. Plutus was here before I joined on as a consultant at IOHK. Uh, so um, I've done most of my work in functional languages and much of most of that in a particular functional language called Haskell. Uh, and Haskell's been adopted by certain places again where their, more, their prime concern is to get it right. So Haskell is somewhat less efficient than using C++ if what you're doing is scientific programming, like large arrays. Now, we're not actually doing large arrays here, so I'm not sure what comparisons have been done of the efficiency. Haskell's been getting more and more efficient over the years. So um, I would not want to give the false impression that, okay, in order to be clear here, we've had to give up on efficiency, because in fact, after 30 years of using functional languages, we've gotten pretty good on the efficiency side as well. We are slower for certain applications like scientific programming. I'm not sure to what extent that applies for things like crypto. Uh, but anyhow, uh, they want highly reliable software so they, that they can write rapidly. And so they've used Haskell. A few other places are doing the same thing. Like most banks will be using a functional language and quite a few banks have adopted Haskell. So IOHK has adopted Haskell for implementing much of Cardano uh, in order to ensure that it's a more reliable system. Uh, so they were already heavily using Haskell and they decide to base their smart contract language Plutus on Haskell. So when I came in, I started reviewing it. And then after a while, I made some suggestions to change various things in a direction that I hope would enhance the reliability of the language. So um, Plutus um, started from Haskell, but it's now actually um, well, the two parts of Plutus, this gets into what you just mentioned about off-chain and on-chain. So um, uh, another person from the Haskell community that IOHK has hired is Manuel Chakravarti. So he's actually the lead of the Plutus project, not me, because he can do it half time and I only have uh, one day a week available. Uh, and also, unlike me, He's got lots of experience with developers, and unlike me, he had some previous experience with crypto. So he knew something I didn't, which is that when you write uh, a program to run on something like Ethereum, then uh, the example he likes to point to is um, a crowdfunding smart contract. And uh, he found eight specific ones that we had some numbers to look at. I don't have those numbers in front of me, but basically you write a certain number of lines of solidity. And then to drive that, you also need to write some stuff in JavaScript that can run in your wallet and that you can um, invoke to then invoke stuff, the transactions that you need to run the smart contract. And in fact, this particular thing, which was quite typical, I think, it had a few more lines of, it had like 80 lines of solidity and 120 lines of JavaScript of that order. Those are not the exact numbers. Um, so you end up having to write in two different languages. And clearly that makes things more difficult. Right? Generally speaking, right, if you have to work in two languages rather than one, it's not going to be twice as difficult. It's going to be more than twice as difficult because you've got one language, the other language, and making them work together. Uh, so he cottoned on to that. And we have some standard techniques and programming languages used to apply to this sort of thing. I knew about some of them because it turns out a similar problem comes up with web servers. You've got stuff that runs on the server, stuff that runs on the client, and those are usually written in different languages. Like your server will be written in Java and in SQL, so two different languages already. And then your client will be written in JavaScript. So there are um, a number of groups, and we were one of them, that said, right, let's have a single language for programming all of that. So we've got a language at Edinburgh called Lynx, where you write everything in Lynx. Uh, we'll run Lynx directly on the server, and then we compile Lynx to JavaScript to run on the client. And then we've also specially developed Lynx so that it's easy to get Lynx to um, drive a database server that uses SQL. So we generate SQL from Lynx. So you write everything in links and then you get other stuff. Interestingly, the same time we were doing links, 
Microsoft started a project called Link, L-I-N-Q, uh, which uses very similar ideas. And um, the guy running that, Eric Meyer, came from the functional programming community. So we were both inspired by the same set of ideas. I would sort of joke about it and say it was the only time I did research work that was commercialized slightly before we did the research. That's a pretty novel idea to write one programming language to do everything that you need instead of all these different languages. Um, I, when I was doing research and looking up your name, I looked up, you know, inventors of programming languages and had Grace Hopper and everybody else in there. And I didn't realize, wow, there is a lot of different programming languages. And it's something that might help shed some light on uh, some of the questions that came up, like uh, understanding Haskell or understanding Plutus is um, I, I'd like to ask Sebastian, Sebastian, you you program in many different languages, and then you've seen Haskell. You've seen Haskell code. Did you recognize it as a software engineer? Were you able to look at Haskell and say, yeah, that kind of makes sense? Or uh, have you learned a little bit about Haskell or Plutus? Yeah, I mean, I think every programming language has some core shared concepts. So usually the hardest thing in computer science is learning your first programming language. And once you learn your first programming language, then it's easier to make the next step. Haskell, of course, being a functional programming language is part of a different tree of languages. And so it requires for people who are not used to it an extra step to, to move into this different branch. But once you, you, you're you familiar with one functional programming language, usually moving to another is not that hard. They're all uh, very similar in that family. And so Plutus uh, falls into the, the, the functional uh, branch of, of programming languages. And so for somebody who Notes Haskell, which every year becomes increasingly easier to learn. It should not be too hard to kind of move into this space. But one question I, I want to ask that's kind of relevant to this is if you look at old presentations by iOS K, Plutus was originally kind of pitched as similar to Haskell, but not Haskell. It's like some simpler uh, functional programming language that should be easier to use and only has you know certain features related to smart contracts. And over time, this has evolved kind of to being Haskell plus uh, Plutus TX, which is embedded inside your Haskell program. And so I'm curious as to kind of the evolution uh, of the design and why the I was kid decided to basically go kind of all in on, on Haskell, even on, on the smart contract side. Uh, right. So um, the Plutus was always designed to look like Haskell. Um, but um, it was when Manuel came on board, which was only um, after the Lisbon meeting last year, that we realized, oh, there are these two different issues. You need to have the off-chain stuff and the on-chain stuff. And then we uh, came up with the solution of doing it all in Haskell and then using uh, Haskell to generate the on-chain stuff. So you run the Haskell off-chain, it does all the off-chain stuff for you, and you also use it to generate the on-chain stuff. So a standard technique in programming languages is something called metaprogramming. So that's a program that generates another program. And it's really pretty straightforward, right? The real representation of a program is as a tree. And hey, trees are a data structure that programs can manipulate. So it's all fairly straightforward. Um, to make it easy to write the tree, you'd like to write it in the same syntax that you write programs in the language. So you just put a, um, a marker in the language that says, here, I'm now writing a program. And this is going to be data for my program. Uh, and that's called metaprogramming. Uh, and you have some kind of symbol. So the technical name for this is quotation. You have a bit of your program in quotes. And that would be the bit that um, runs on-chain rather than off-chain. Uh, so we've, we've got some special symbols in Haskell. They've been there for a long time. It's something called template Haskell that lets you write programs inside Haskell using Haskell. And so what um, Plutus TX is, is just the subset of Haskell that we can compile to run on the chain. Because not everything runs on the chain, obviously. Uh, so the bits that we can run on the chain is that's the subset of Haskell that we use. And then we compile that down to a different language that we call Plutus Core. Uh, so any developer using Plutus doesn't really need to know Plutus Core. They just need to know Haskell 
and the subset of Haskell that can compile to Plutus Core. And that's it, that's all they need to know. But then actually running on the blockchain, we have Plutus Core and Plutus Core is much, much, much simpler than Haskell. You would like to validate stuff. To validate stuff, you'd like to actually prove mathematically that it has certain properties. And to do that, you want to have a really simple model of what you're doing. Uh, and even though um, uh, Haskell being a functional language, it's a lot easier to reason about than an imperative language usually. The reason for that being, by the way, in an imperative language, you've got state and anybody can change the state at any time. Uh, and particularly in a concurrent world, somebody else might change the state underneath you. And that gets really difficult. In Haskell, there is no notion of state. Um, you just have values. There's a special way of manipulating state where you treat the state, the thing that manipulates the state is itself a value. Uh, so everything is all done with values. That makes it much easier to reason about. So for developers, they use Haskell and then they use a subset of Haskell inside quotation marks called um, Plutus TX. But all of that is basically just Haskell. It compiles to something called Plutus Core, which is uh, in one-to-one -one correspondence with Plutus TX. So we picked a very simple subset of Haskell. And the reason for that is even though Haskell is easy to reason about, it's quite a large language. And what you want is something that has no hidden corners at all. So Plutus Core is a very, very tiny language. And it started out, in fact, a bit larger. And um, one of the things I did in this Lisbon talk is I said, you know, what we should do is make this really, really tiny. And uh, what we ended up doing was picking a language that's been around since the 70s. Uh, and which is basically just a small extension of Lambda calculus, which has been around since the 1930s. So we're basically using a programming language that's a bit older than stored program computers. And one reason for doing that is you don't want to have hard forks very often, right? When you do a design, you want to get it right. You don't want to have to change it when you discover you've left something out. So by picking something that is, uh, has been around since before there were computers, we hope that there are not lots of little hidden corners here and that that will help us to make things more reliable. Uh, if you look at something like the EVM, it's got lots of hidden corners, lots of places where there are like two different ways of doing the same thing or lots of places like to do this thing safely, you must make sure to check that everything went right afterwards, rather than just having it raise an exception, have everything shut down if something went wrong, you're supposed to explicitly check. So there's a whole industry of people just saying, here, I will make your uh, Ethereum program more reliable because I will check the solidity to make sure it doesn't have these commonly known errors. Whereas what you'd like to do is design a language that just doesn't have those errors in it. So by picking something that's so old and so simple um, I think there's a whole class of errors that we can just rule out. That's not going to be there. Uh, and then we can start looking for the much more subtle errors instead.